text will be studying in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 13. Therefore I ask you, if you do not lose heart because of my, of my tribulation for you, which is your glory. And um, we've been asking the question, what way would his tribulations or results of them affect the believers in his area? And we've had some suggestions, of course, along the line that uh, Paul perhaps was carrying for his burden himself and therefore something he did. But we find that the same thing happened to Jesus Christ who said he did not carry his own burden and left the burden all in God's care. Let's read it to us, comment in Desire Bates 471 to the text in Isaiah 53 verses 3 and 4, that is being stricken, smitten, and afflicted. This takes the first second and third paragraphs uh, on page 471. It was generally believed, etc. So I'll go to that place. It was generally believed by the Jews that sin is punished in this month. Every affliction was regarded as the penalty of some wrongdoing, either of the sufferer himself or of his parents. It is true that all suffering results from the transgression of God's law. But this truth had become perverted. Satan, the author of sin and all its results, had led men to look upon disease and death as preceding, proceeding from God, as punishment arbitrarily inflicted on account of sin. Hence, one upon whom some great affliction or calamity had fallen had the additional burden of being regarded as a great sinner. Thus, the way was prepared for the Jews to reject Jesus. He who hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows was looked upon by the Jews as stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, and they hid their faces from him. God had given a lesson designed to prevent this. The history of Job had shown that suffering is inflicted by Satan and is overruled by God for purposes of mercy. But Israel did not understand the lesson. The same error for which God had reproved the friends of Job was repeated by the Jews in their rejection of Christ. Thank you very much. Now let's take the main point in this little paragraph. First of all, the Jews looked upon all suffering as a result of transgression of God's law, which in a certain sense it was. But this too had become perverted. Now, when they believed that all suffering was caused by man's personal transgression, and that God was arbitrarily punishing that person for his sins, then they did not help because they would feel they were, they were fighting against God's purpose. If God was punishing, let him punish. Don't work against God and bring him to that person. Now Christ didn't uh, support that teaching, and furthermore he stepped in and he healed the sick and did the very thing the Pharisees would not do. Now the point though is this, that um, this led them to reject Jesus Christ when he came, very thing Paul feared they might do in regard to his own experience as well. Because Christ's sufferings took a fearful toll upon him to the point where he was looked upon or seen to be stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. And the word stricken is a word which talks about a person having a stroke. Isn't that right? He obviously couldn't have had a stroke. He never, never, ever was ill, was he? Well, he appeared to have been well. What appears or what really is is, is yeah. a, uh, <laughs> he, he, he didn't have a stroke as far as the actual breakdown of his nervous system was concerned. He did, did suffer a, uh, a stroke on the Mount of Temptation when he came from that weak, worn, and emaciated. Yeah, it seems, uh, you know, like in the health message, um, I can remember you bringing out very clearly the fact that Christ was never sick. Quite right, I'm not saying it's not yeah. saying it's sick. So, well, where do we go? I'm just in my so mind. Saying he appeared stricken. Appeared. Or was he stricken? Well, he was stricken, yes. But there was a, uh, a tax he suffered. He wasn't sick, but he, but he suffered, suffered a tax. Physical exhaustion. <laughs> yes, and, and also mental and uh, nervous exhaustion, too. Let's go back a moment to uh, the description given of Christ's uh, temptation in the wilderness and uh, see what state he was brought down to by the suffering to which he passed. Not the first chapter of temptation, but the uh, next one talks about the victory being gained. And um, Jesus uh, actually was at the point of death when uh, he was rescued by the angels from death itself. So on page 131, I think, yeah, 
page 131, the paragraph which reads, After the flow of the pardon, Jesus was exhausted to the earth. <coughs> After the flow had departed, Jesus fell exhausted to the earth with the power of death upon his face. The angels of heaven had watched the conflict, beholding their loved commander as he passed through inexpressible suffering to make a way of escape for us. He had endured the test greater than we shall ever be called to endure. The angels now ministered to the Son of God as he lay like one dying. He was strengthened with food, comforted with the message of his Father's love, and the assurance that all heaven triumphed in his victory. Warming to life again, his great heart goes out in sympathy for man, and he goes forth to complete the work he has begun, to rest not until the foe is vanquished in our fallen race we do. Next I got two plates. Never can the cost of our redemption be realized until the redeemed shall stand with the Redeemer before the throne of God. Then, as the glories of the eternal home burst upon our enraptured senses, we shall remember that Jesus left all this for us, that he not only became an exile from the heavenly courts, but for us took the risk of failure and eternal loss. Then we shall cast our crowns at his feet and raise the song, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Thank you very much. Now, these two paragraphs describe the exhaustion which overtook Christ mm-hmm. at this point of time. He spent the previous 40 days fasting, no food during that period of time. But there was the least of his suffering, the least of his tax. Or what was the heaviest tax upon his nervous system during that period? The awesome struggle for the powers of darkness. Also, he was actually a sin bearer at that stage, wasn't he? Well, not so much as so late in Gethsemane. No, but it's a part of Stella Mayer talked about that he wore that test, he wore that appetite. That's right. Another sacrifice, the test on appetite, and the love of this world, and so forth, right? And the pressure brought to bear upon him during that period was awesome because it looked as if the work was going to fail in his death. He had looked at the God of the Slaken and Satan had all his own way, right? So it was a desperate situation. Now, that kind of experience must take its toll upon the person passing through it. It must. Even Christ uh, went, through, went through it too. Now, I believe, I think he would, would do it during his, his youth, his boy and youth, Christ was an extremely healthy person, ruddy and good looking and, uh, and, and, and nice. But he emerged from this struggle a very different looking person altogether, one prematurely aged and uh, haggard and worn and apparently stricken. Let's um, go, now, go now to the uh, next chapter, which deals with the recognition by John of Jesus Christ at the Jordan River, page 137. And as John saw Jesus Christ approach, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God is taken by the sin of the world. But he spoke to everybody by inspiration, not by physical recognition. Someone read, please, page 137. They were in the throng, some as Christ's baptism. There were in the throng some who at Christ's baptism had beheld the divine glory and had heard the voice of God. But since that time, the Savior's appearance had greatly changed. At his baptism, they had seen his countenance transfigured in the light of heaven. Now, pale, worn, and emaciated, he had been recognized only by the prophet John. Right. So now That's he was changed. pale, he was worn and emaciated. What is emaciation? Skin of the bone. I think we use the skin of the bone, right? Okay. So do he look a sick man? Yeah. He must have, must he? Do he look stricken? He sure did. And because he looked it, the Jews saw him as one stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, and they hid their faces from him. Okay? And uh, this will always be the case with folk who fail to truly appreciate the cost paid by any one of us in our ministry for God. And Paul was concerned that in his day, people should likewise uh, lose their faith in the message and become discouraged because of his own personal appearance as a worn and sometimes hated messenger of God. So he said, therefore I ask that you do not lose heart of my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Now on a daily basis, Jesus Christ paid a fearful tax on his resources as well. They had to go to the woods and mountains and stream sides to replenish the supply 
and come back each morning refreshed to be reinvigorated. So I, I, I've been quite impressed lately to find statements in regard to Paul and in regard to Jesus Christ talk about their being in fear, or Paul being filled by disease and suffering fearfully because of the price he paid for those who he ministered. Any further questions on that point before we leave it? read the verse again where Paul said that uh, therefore I ask that you do not lose heart of my tribulations for you which is your glory now, now I, I do believe that Paul understood the principle of leaning upon God completely and upon receiving day by day a fresh supply of divine grace to replace his exhausted uh, nervous system and that he had the power to heal the sick and even to raise the dead Yet he was enfeebled by disease, as Dwight said. Any further thoughts on that? There's a comment in the scripture where you see a gradual loss of, uh, I mean, uh, God did wonderful things for him, to actually raised him up after he was beaten, etc., etc. But then there was a time when he went from one place to another and he asked other people to come with him for his protection. Uh, it just seems like a, he kind of opened the door or lost something there along the way. In my mind, you know the point where I mean, where he he yeah. had other people come with him and for his protection. Not that the particular experience that you can find. Oh yeah, I find it's an axe. Yeah, I guess it would be. Axe the problem. Yeah. What channel? Uh, I had to poke around. Okay, sure, I'll let Bob find it. Yeah, I, I know the statement, I think. Do you? But I don't know what it is, but I, I know what you're talking about. Okay. You know, if he was trusting in the power of God, he wouldn't have needed people to protect, protect him. Doesn't he burden or serve, have an effect on the world? I'm sure those burdens are very taxing, very, very taxing. Indeed, we have to appreciate the fact. What I want you to realize is this, of course, that when God calls you personally, as he certainly will in the last few short weeks, and the meantime, the less less capacity, when God calls you to make a sacrifice for his cause, it, it is a sacrifice. It is a sacrifice. It is a sacrifice. You're going to pay for it. And there is natural law uh, that just occurs that fatigue sets in and, and weariness is a result of just natural law right. in, our bo- in our human sure. bodies. At the same time, we're not, not to sink back and um, accept undue fatigue and and the cost of uh, giving the message, we are to lay hold upon the recuperative powers of God to rise up with our weaknesses and weariness and to carry over the work regardless because all his biddings are in the right. Found it, Tom? Oh, thank you. Yeah, um, I, know, I know we all like to think the very best of Paul being uh, respected very greatly, of course, the best of all the apostles. But even the best of men can make mistakes at times. We are learn by the mistakes, not to criticize. Not, not, not to criticize. Yes, if you look at all the other uh, disciples, they all made mistakes too. So I don't see that Paul should necessarily have to be any different. And that we should regard him any the less because of it. Quite true. All of this is just for our learning, isn't it? Sure, sure. But we're concerned, of course, with Paul's statement here that uh, he hoped that others would not be as <coughs> because of his uh, suffering. He's a, he's a subject of our consideration right now. At the same time, you recognize the other men made mistakes as well. But not, we're, not, we're, not, we're not talking about them at the moment. When you find a time, we'll carry yeah. on. When you find a call out, we'll give our message to the then, right? Very good. Then we'll come back to Ephesians, the uh, first chapter, the uh, third chapter rather. We're now ready to read the last part of the chapter from verses 14 down to verse 21. So I'd like to read this with please. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and 
to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Thank you very much. Now, it's obvious that Paul became a little, quite, quite a good bit carried away by the glory and the wonder what he beheld in the gospel. To him, the gospel was a living force, a mighty power, a transforming, saving, regenerating power. It was something very beautiful, something very desirable, something very effective, something that he could put his entire trust in. That's why he said in Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God of the salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first of the Gentile. And he keeps, in this book of peace that we find, he keeps coming back with, with these prayers, there's one back in the first chapter, as you may recall, in which he asked for us to have our understanding open so that we could see. Then, then, he, then he returned again to more considerations of gospel truth. And once again, he breaks forth in this great desire that the disciples of Jesus everywhere may understand and see the full beauty and strength and power of gospel truth. Now, he realized, of course, that in himself, as a man, there was not the capacity or the power to convey a true and comprehensive picture of these things. Right? He knew that. And so, he turned to the source of strength, the source of wisdom and light, recognized that God is the teacher of his people, and verse 14 he says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Which, which is just another way of saying I knelt in prayer, or I sought the audience chamber of the Most High to solve my problem and appeal to him to give to what I can't give myself. As we read on, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So once again we have this family picture protruding through the Father image of God and the Son and the Brother of Jesus Christ and the whole family made up of all the believers both in heaven above and down here on the earth below. You like the fact that Paul keeps bringing this family picture into the, in the book of Ephesians? It's very, very nice and very encouraging, isn't it? That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit, or through his spirit, in me and a man. Now, what does the word grant mean? It means to give, to endow, to supply, to, to present, and so forth, right? So, here he's asking God to give to each believer the strength to understand and perceive the glorious truth which he's trying to convey to them. Now what is the great promise in the Bible in regard to acquiring wisdom? You know what it is? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God gives to all men liberally and of faith not. Now do we, especially as we read, well, I think I should say it this way, as we read these pages in the book of Ephesians, we must become aware of the fact that it's a vast and wonderful array of truth out there which Paul sort of we haven't seen yet. Then you should feel a sense of need to have greater wisdom and, and strength and understanding in, in regards to these things. And then the promise should be very precious to us to ask of him who gives to all men liberally and upbraids not. Right, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might to the spirit of the inner man. Now what words in that sentence particularly strike your mind?
grant you, according to that, he would grant you this, this, this strength and this power to perceive. Now, the better we understand and see for ourselves the power and the depth of the character of God, the bolder our prayer is going to be, is it not? And the richer is going to be the answer to the as the Lord says, uh, as Paul says, according to the riches of his glory. Not poly, but riches. Now, is God rich in glory? Infinitely, immeasurably, and searchably so. It's beyond all, all, um, uh, all mental scope to really appreciate and see that. So we can understand, of course, that as we grow in grace, we shall see more and more of that glory, and we see more and more of that strength, and see more and more of God's glory, and, and gain still more of that strength, so to see still more again. And then as far up as it goes on forever and ever. So this grant or this gift or this endowment which comes to us according to the riches of his glory, so we can be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Now, what is the inner man? Referred to his Now, those two words, of course, the most significant. In the inner man, what does that refer to? Your stomach? My spiritual, my spiritual nature. It's your mental and spiritual powers, right? The indwelling, the in present, mental and spiritual powers. So he should be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love, etc. Now, what words in this text really grasp our minds now? That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, the presence of Christ in us is the key of knowledge. I'd like to stress that point very strongly right now. Let's go to John, the third chapter, a moment, to see how significant this point actually is. John, the third chapter. Uh, this is the, the famous conversation called between Nicodemus and Jesus Christ on that, on that famous night that Christ told him he must be born again. And Nicodemus came to Jesus Christ, secretly by night, to question him in regard to the kingdom to be established in this world. Nicodemus, of course, uh, sharing the Jewish notion that the kingdom would be a material world of power and glory, supported by an army of swords and spears and armor. And we rule just like David did, or Solomon, or Saul, or those early Jewish kings. But Christ came to establish a different kind of kingdom altogether, <laughs> and no one knew this for himself until they finally caught the point later on. Let's read verse 3, please. Uh, John 3, verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Thank you. Now, years ago, I used to look upon those scriptures referring to the kingdom to be established when Christ returns in power and glory. A kingdom peopled by immortal souls, by thought in terms of a capital city, and uh, nations of the earth worshipping and serving that the king of kings and lord of lords in that capital city. I've now come to recognize that the kingdom of God is a spiritual force. It is the divine order. It is, in short, the mystery of God. It is Christ in you to have the glory. It is, in short, the entire gospel story, the whole fact, the whole uh, scope of the gospel message. <coughs> now, Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you cannot see, perceive, comprehend, and understand the kingdom. Right? You just can't do it. It's a physical impossibility. It's a spiritual impossibility. What verse in 1 Corinthians uh, repeats the same truth? Spiritual things are right, and and we can't discern them unless we have the spiritual qualification within. So that Jesus made it very plain to Nicodemus that unless he was born again, he could not even see the kingdom of God. It would be absolutely impossible to do it. Quite impossible. And this means when a messenger comes today and claims to be sent of God, be it man, woman, or child, as the case may be, and that person does not understand the gospel message claims to be a great teacher of truth sent from heaven, then do we need to listen to that person? Can that person see the truth? No. Impossible, quite impossible. He may claim to be, but he can't. So when, for instance, a Jehovah's Witness comes to my door in Australia and starts to talk about uh, coming kingdom and all that, I say yes, but they just stop right there a moment. 
I said, I, I know there's a coming kingdom and I want to be prepared for it. Would you therefore tell me how I can be saved from sin and walk in righteousness and be prepared for that kingdom? And they can't do it. I said, well, that, that's, that's the end of the story. I said, I said, no more. Unless you tell me that, you can't tell me anything. I take a right stand. Right, it's a correct just to take. And so it applies to every message that ever comes to you. Just ask them, first of all, what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? Explain that to me. If they can't do it, what about the rest? So they have no contribution to make whatsoever. None at all. Spiritual things are only for those in whom the Spirit of God dwell. We have to be alive in Christ and Christ in us if we're going to perceive spiritual things. So, um, going back to verse 17, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the same words of wit and length and depth and height and so on. So that uh, Paul says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you may be able to comprehend. <coughs> the same truth what you again as Christ spoke to Nicodemus on that faith on that wonderful night. Let me really stress that point. Unless you're born again, unless Christ dwells in your heart through faith, you cannot see the truth of God. Impossible. Faith, the work of God is the key of knowledge, and God is a teacher of His people. That, that God is a teacher of Him. His people. Not all men, but all men want to learn. But God teaches His people, and what God teaches, of course, is well learned and truth. Now, what are we to comprehend? Verse 18. What is the width and length, the depth and the height of what? Pardon? The the yeah, right. Verse 19 answers the question that's just been stated. I think it's quite right. I'd like to read it, please. And to know the love of Christ, which passes, passes knowledge, that he might be fulfilled with all the fullness of God. Good. To know, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that, that should be filled with all the forms of good now, all the forms of God, rather. Now we find now that, that, that to know is by purpose, to know that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Which comes first, knowing or filling? Knowing. Why, why does this come first? Okay. What 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 are the requisites for being filled apart from knowing? But you must have desire, a sense of need, a measure of faith, and you must ask. Now if you don't know what if you don't know, how can you ask for it? You have a sense of need of it. You can't. So therefore, first of all comes a knowledge of the love of God which passes knowledge, and this is done so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, you may be stimulated to reach out and, and lay hold upon and possess the gift that God offers to us. And when that comes, of course, uh, then we do possess the beautiful, indwelling presence of the Spirit of God. Now, now comes these two verses, which are very challenging, I think, to say the least in verse 21 of Ephesians, the third chapter. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Excuse me. Amen. I find verse 20 very challenging verse, and all strict honesty, I have to ask myself the question, have I experienced Christ doing exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or all that I could ask or think in my experience? And I have to say yes in certain in certain occasions in the past. Now before you become a born again Christian, did you have any concept of what God could do for you? Any real concept? No, we didn't. We battled with sin. We were in the Roman 7 experiment. We, we tried, we failed, we tried, we failed, and we tried to fail again and again and again and again. And so the thing went on, it seemed interminably. And uh, while this was going on, we had no concept of the wonderful release we could experience by 
giving to go on our old carnal mind and receiving a new mind all to get in the place of the old. And then God came one day to us and did for us exceed, exceeding abundant of all we could then ask or think was possible and we rejoiced in that glorious wonderful blessing. But is that the only occasion when we have experienced this, this kind of answer to our prayers? No, no way at all. At ever in, in ever increasing levels, at higher and higher points, we have experienced more and more of the same thing. Now, at the present time, what is the great blessing that we ask for and think about? Okay, have we, have we, have we experienced this exceeding, exceeding abundant gift in that regard yet? Not yet. When it comes to God, we shall surely say, this is the exceeding abundant of all we can ask or think. At the same time, we are to be challenged by this promise in this particular scripture to claim the blessing we've never done before. I feel moved to go back to Proverbs and Kings and to that statement in regard to unfortunate prayer, which you read in the very earliest part of this week, uh, dealing with the, the true science of prayer. This statement comes from the experience of Elijah. <laughs> Elijah must have been a very remarkable man and had a tremendous faith and courage and uh, man of course in by his right name and certainly shook the foundations of Ahab's government. So, 
in the very first step toward achieving the prayer of Paul in Ephesians, the third chapter, comes the need for us to actually know, know the promises of God for ourselves. And we stress again the point, it's not enough to memorize them, to know where they're bound and be able to repeat them. We must take them into ourselves until we actually absorb the sheer power in them and know, and know them as the living glory of God and the living power of God. And we are, we are then to match the promise to, to whatever need arises, different promises of course with different needs. Now, I, I found this very important, we should approach the hour of prayer with it absolutely set on our minds that the gifts of promise is not a maybe or a possibility or possibly it's a certainty. When God makes the promise, He means exactly what He says, and will do all He said, even exceeding exceed above all you can ask or think. So, when the hour of need is there, let's come and come knowing the promise, and let's cling to it, knowing it must be fulfilled to us, no matter what the cost may be, by the course we fulfill the condition to bring away sin and walk in righteousness. I'm just going to say on page 8, the prophet, you know, page 158,
that he hoped to be there at Pentecost. And an overruling providence permitted the apostle to be delayed on this occasion, for he had been present at the Passover. He would have been accused of instigating a riot and massacre, which was caused by the pretensions of an Egyptian imposter claiming to be the Messiah, end quote. Well, we could say that Paul was like a slave in here when he took by the protection, but it was a bit harsh, I think, too. Well, the article says already, well, what the article is saying is that as a result of him not, to the church it came the decision to not to let the, or to allow the Gentiles to be themselves, okay? And then, but it, maybe I better read it. It's just two paragraphs. I believe it's Ron Parsons. It's a lesson in righteousness. Two paragraphs he talks about it. The next chapter of the books of Acts talks about chapter 15 of the settling of the question regarding the symbolism of the apostate Jewish church. In the Council of Jerusalem, it was recognized that these symbols should be positively disregarded by the Gentiles, Alex, converts. But it was not really recognized that there was, quote, no difference between us and them, unquote, in that the council failed to see that the Jewish, Alex, converts should be also positively, Alex, disregard them. In Jerusalem, the Christians continued to attend the temple and to fulfill the ceremonies of the rejected Jewish church, not realizing that in this symbolism they were practicing, practically denying that the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ had fulfilled the types. But they should have seen this and were therefore guilty of gross transgression. Not even Paul, the great Christian, saw the depths of this departure from righteousness. In the company of the Jews for whom he was laboring, it was within righteousness to respect their ceremonies without antagonizing them. But to practice the same rituals in a Christian atmosphere was absolute heresy. Quote, as a precautionary measure, Paul wisely advised Timothy to be circumcised, not that God required it, but in order to remove from the minds of the Jews that which might be an objective to Timothy's ministration. While he had conceded this much to the Jewish prejudice, he believed and he believed and taught that circumcision or uncircumcision to be nothing and the gospel of Christ everything. Acts of the Apostles, page 204. So whatever, you know. What's the point of God's bold? Well, it's a what he's saying in the article is that he's gradually because of that one mistake, he's gradually, as she says, already, it seems that that he was giving a second thoughts about the wisdom of his course for it appears to be looking to his brethren for protection. Acts 20 verse 20 verse 4. He was no longer consciously innocent or conscient, consciously obedient, for he was no longer exercising conscious faith in God alone for for protection. Oh, I understand. Well, he's he's the messenger goes by the well, it should have been never printed then. I mean, everything that's printed in the messenger is kind of supposed to be true and uplifting. I mean, do you print something that you do not agree with? Yeah, but well, anyway, well, I see that in that statement that Paul began to capitulate. It was the beginning of the capitulation to the acceding to the wishes of his brethren, which led to his demise. That's possible. Yeah. But I'm not sure that I can say he was wrong in seeking or taking this way for protection. Well, it was, I guess, the whole question originated from why Paul wasn't as healthy as he could have. The promise wasn't up. There was nothing wrong with the promise, but there might have been a problem. Christ himself also appeared to be stricken as well. That's I accept the night before is the only case to be considered. Christ was also in the same situation.